good afternoon. Thank you for joining us here. Welcome to the International Spy Museum. My name is Vince Houghton. I'm the museum's historian and curator. And we have an extra special treat today. This was not an event that even existed about a week ago. We were able to put this together very quickly, and we appreciate you all coming out. Uh, we couldn't miss the opportunity to uh, have this man, Jack Barsky, sit in front of you today. I guess. How do I? Oh, you're on, you're on. on. Memphis will take care of you. Um, if you don't know his background, we're going to talk about it today, but just to give you a brief introduction. Uh, this is a life that uh, is as improbable as it comes. Uh, we talk a lot here in the museum about how spy pop culture is not necessarily true uh, in many ways, about how it over-exaggerates what espionage actually is. Uh, here we're going to actually see a true spy story uh, that really got its beginning in a very humble backwaters, if I can use that word, of East Germany. Uh, but turned into a downright fascinating story um, about a man recruited by the KGB to infiltrate the United States uh, and then spent 10 years actively spying for the Soviets. Uh, he resigned, and I joked earlier that I'm not sure you can actually do that, uh, from the KGB, uh, but then embarked on a very successful second career uh, in information management. Uh, when he was finally discovered by the FBI in the 1990s, uh, he had wealth of information to give them. Uh, in return, uh, they let him become a real U.S. citizen. Uh, and now he's as patriotic as you and I, living as an American. Um, and taking advantage of all the things that he couldn't have uh, behind the Iron Curtain as a normal life here in the United States. Uh, one interesting thing, he is the longest surviving known member of the KGB illegals program that operated during the Cold War. Uh, so if you've seen shows like The Americans, you know, Philip and Elizabeth Jennings, the main character, those were Soviet illegals. Uh, Jack is the longest surviving member and, and operated for uh, many, many years here inside the United States. He's also the author of the book Deep Undercover, My Secret Life in Tangled Allegiances as a KGB Spy in America, which we'll have in the back. And if you stay a little bit to sign them, uh, cool. I'd be happy to do that. So welcome, Jack. Thank you for taking the time to talk to us here at the International Spy Museum. Thank you. Can, can I say something? Absolutely. Um, the longest surviving member really is, is important to me. I'm still very competitive. <laughs> the, the, the person who had the record was uh, uh, also known as uh, Colonel Abel. His real name was Eddie Fisher, actually. And he was featured in the Bridge of Spies. He, he managed to stay here undetected for eight years. I actually managed for 10 and another nine until the FBI finally found me. But after 10 years, I did that resignation thing. I would say the longest surviving is probably the key word. <laughs> yeah, you know, that too. On that, but also, <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I want to start by talking about luck. And I think does luck play such a key role in your story, both good and bad, um, starting with where you were born. So, I mean, a lot of people have conversations about, God, we're so lucky to be born here in the United States, or I can't imagine how it would be being born in the third world. We're not having the same kind of creature comforts we have here. Well, you were born in East Germany. Right. during the beginning of the Cold War, when there really wasn't a lot of creature comforts. It wasn't just that East Germany was behind. During the Second World War and right after, the Soviets had stripped essentially most of what mattered inside East Germany. That was the world you were born into. That's right. Uh, as far east as you could go in Germany without being in Poland, uh, I consider myself sort of a, as a result of World War II because my parents met because there was, uh, towards the end of the war, uh, uh, people would flee the oncoming Russian army, and they would go uh, west, didn't get very far, but they wound up in the same space, and that's how I got created in 1949. Uh, so without that war, I wouldn't be here, and, on, and, without, uh, and, and I wound up uh, in, in the Soviet-occupied part of uh, uh, Germany, which then became the German Democratic Republic, a communist uh, satellite to the Soviet Union. So without communism, I wouldn't have signed up with the KGB. And without that, I wouldn't be here. And without that, I wouldn't be an American citizen today. So this is all a, total, a bit bizarre, but there's a whole lot more to my story that you know, you shake your head and say, that really happened? Well, I think what was interesting is without the war even more so, you wouldn't have been in this position because many people here may not understand, in East Germany during that time, the war was still very fresh and Hitler 
was still very fresh, and fighting fascism, and Stalin and the communists and the Soviets leading the fight, and basically doing all the heavy lifting against the Soviet, uh, against the Germans during the war. How did that shape your, your youth and your, your sure. ideology? Uh, well, uh, the Soviet Union, uh, as some of you may know, uh, bore the heaviest brunt in, in the fight against uh, Hitler. And uh, so we, East Germany, became on, you know, came on the Soviet uh, influence, and uh, you know we were very glad that, that we were we were an anti-fascist type nation. Uh, and I tell people this is one of the one of the biggest mistakes I think the United States made or the CIA, whoever made that decision, was to co-opt. Uh, uh, Nazi military intelligence, also known as the Galen Organization. Reinhard Galen was the head of that uh, organization that uh, that we knew was co-opted by the CIA, and it eventually became the Bundesnachrichtendienst, that is the the uh, West German intelligence agency. So that, that they were all Nazis, and and we were on the other side because the the only political force that actively fought the Nazis in the streets before they uh, took power were the communists. So we were the good guys, they were the bad guys. Uh, I believe that that, that juxtaposition uh, allowed for years and years and years of propaganda, in addition to uh, some ex-Nazis becoming, you know, even uh, there was a chancellor in the West Germany who called Georg Kiesinger, who was a mem had been a member of the Nazi party. So, you know, I was ideologically fully convinced that we were on the right side of history, and, I, and that was the, the major reason I jumped in and said yes when the KGB knocked on the door. It's one thing to learn basic tradecraft and, and skill sets that can be taught. It's another thing to have the psychological makeup to be an effective undercover spy inside the United States. What of your upbringing and your intelligence and everything you, you learned until you were recruited by the KGB made you the right person for this kind of a job? Well, it was a pretty tough life. Uh, we, we were poor, we didn't know it though, but you know, there was a lot of delayed gratification involved. There was a lot of discipline. You know, I, my parents were typical Germans and you know, I, I had to be followed their rules to a T. Uh, and uh, I learned early on that nobody really cared about me, so I could, should, should take care of myself. There's a bunch of examples in the book about that. You know, there's a mental toughness. And my mother kicked me out of the house early. You know, I, she, she, and that was, she meant well. She sent me to a boarding school when I was 14, so I, I learned how to say goodbye. And then I went to university that was so far away that I, I never I had a chance to go home uh, only during summer recess. So, so there, there were a lot of things that uh, uh, were in combination made me a, a good, from a psychology aspect, a good candidate to sort of say goodbye to everything that I knew and everybody I knew and then start over someplace else. I can still do it today. I just moved my, my family from upstate New York to Atlanta. And, I don't, it didn't bother me one bit. And my girls are a little bit, that's my girls, my wife and my daughter, uh, they have, they're homesick and I'm not. <laughs> Lots of training to get out of that. <laughs> uh, today, if you wanted to join the CIA, you go online to CIA.gov and apply there. Uh, the KGB had a different way of doing things, but when they recruited you, they didn't just say, come work for us. And what's interesting, and you, you really lay this out in the book well, if anyone's interested in this process, it's done here in such a great way. They really slow played your recruitment. They didn't come right out and say, Jack or, or Albrecht, we want you to join the KGB. They took their time to make sure you were the right fit. Can you talk a little bit about your recruitment process? Yeah, it, it was a mutual feeling out. Uh, uh, initially, it was just, uh, you know, uh, the question was asked, well, would you be interested in something like this? And at that point, I, it was quite clear to me I could have said no. And when I said, well, let's take a look, and you know, they, they needed to find out for themselves whether they thought I was uh, the right material uh, because, you know, you, from, from, from early on, it was clear that uh, if, the, if I were to sign with them, so to speak, 
it would be for undercover work. And you, as, as uh, uh, Vince pointed out, that uh, it, it re requires a certain personality to, to, to be able to do that. So uh, they, they learned about me. We met with, I met with my handler for once a week, and we talked about everything, life uh, issues. And uh, we became pretty good friends. He got to know me very well. And on top of it, he gave me little tasks and you know, try this, you know, you know, go do an investigation over there, uh, find out you know, about this particular object, write a report, and on and on and on. And I bet you he wrote a report back to the center every time we met. And on, uh, at my end, it was he, he gradually introduced me to the idea of what it would be like to do this kind of work. It took about a year and a half before they popped the question. And when that po question was popped, it was done by a very senior person in Berlin, and uh, I had 24 hours to say yes or no. I could, I could have said no at that point still, because you don't, for this kind of work, you don't work with somebody who you uh, encourage or force in, into the service. It needs to be a volunteer. I want to ask you about your first impressions uh, during a training mission to West Berlin. That was your first chance to see the the West that had been just given to you through propaganda and through other you know, ideas. What, what did you see when you went to West Berlin? How did that, did that change your ideology? Did it change your opinion or just reinforce what you've been told? Well, first of all, I need to give uh, folks a perspective. In those days, uh, we didn't have color TV and uh, I lived in, a, in an area where you couldn't get West German TV at all. Uh, we were we called it the, the Valley of the Clueless. Um, and so I had no idea what, what, I would, what I would find on the other side of the wall. And the first impression I got was, oh my, there's a lot of color in this world. Uh, you know, the, 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 the buildings had color, the people were dressed nicely. In, in the East, everything was gray and brown. Uh, so that was interesting, but it certainly didn't make a dent in my ideology. Um, the the other thing that it, it was, I was scared out of my mind. I thought, you know, I was running around with the uh, with the, uh, the three letters on my forehead saying KGB, and every cop that I saw, I said, oh, he wants to talk to me. No, uh, I met, I survived. It was psychologically rather stressful because this was enemy territory. This was where this was the folks that I was going to fight in my sort of way. Yeah. Yeah. We were joking when we talked earlier that we were going to have you come out with a thick German accent just to kind of mess with the audience a little bit. Be like, yeah, I don't know Martin. why the Americans didn't understand. <laughs> uh, but clearly you don't have one. If anything, you've got a Jersey or a New York accent. You, you didn't grow up speaking English. You learn English as a second diary or maybe a tertiary language. Let's talk about your English training because many people in this room have probably taken a language in school. Uh, I took Spanish for the better part of a decade, and I only know the bad words, but I can pronounce them <laughs> really, really well. Um, but learning English or learning a second language to be as deep undercover as you were, it wasn't just about learning vocabulary. No. It's about learning nuance and slang right. and accent. Can you talk about yeah. how, how did that training work for you? No, no, you're doing that again. You're asking like three questions at right. one time. <laughs> uh, I, I, I took... Uh, we had compulsory Russian in school starting in sixth grade, and I studied Russian for six years, and I remembered next to nothing. We also had uh, voluntary English. We could either take French or English. I took English, and that came very easily to me, but I didn't re retain much. Uh, when, uh, when I was in training in Berlin, I was supposed to be headed to West Germany. That was the normal way you know, to send a German to the other side of Germany undercover. That's really easy. But I also was uh, told, you know, you need to learn one other language. So I picked English. And I started learning English. And as I told you before, uh, I'm pretty competitive. So, and I worked hard. So I start, and I learned, and I learned. Uh, and so about a year and a half into my training, uh, some visitor from Moscow came over and asked me, so how's your English? I said, oh, and I pulled out a, a book. I said, I'm reading this novel, by the way. I don't need a dictionary. He went, huh? And I said, OK, why don't you make a tape and see what you, know, what you sound like? So I made a tape, sent it to Moscow. 
and they immediately flew me into Moscow and had me interview with the uh, two ladies. One was a professor of English, a Russian, at the Moscow University, worked for the KGB, obviously. Uh, and the other one was a, an American who had uh, emigrated with, she married a, a, a Russian, most likely KGB, and, uh, and they interviewed me separately and uh, to determine as to whether I could, I had the ability to learn English as well enough to claim to have been born in, in the United States. And uh, it was a tie. The American said he can, and the, the Russian professor said, no, ah, no way. And you know, here wishful thinking comes in, so when that, uh, the, the, uh, the commerce that made the decision figured, you know, let's, let's give it a shot, it's, it's too tempting. And so then I spent two years in Moscow learning English with, uh, the, my tutor was this, this uh, American lady, and then an, a couple who is uh, well known in, in, uh, amongst, in circles such as the folks who have run the spy museum. Uh, and, I, and, and I threw myself at that task, and I really wanted to succeed. And it sort of worked out. I now, I now speak English much better than I speak German, that's a fact. <laughs> hey, do, you still, do you still identify with your German name, with your German background? Uh, is that, have you completely left that behind, or is there still something in you that looks back at your youth and well, identifies with that? I went back to Germany now uh, since I became a citizen three times, and the, the, those folks all still call me by my German name or my German nickname, which I hate. But uh, it's OK over there, but I am certainly more the American. And, and there's, I have proof, proof of that. And, I was driving with a history professor the other day in Atlanta in a car, and I was talking about Germany and, and the United States, and I used us and them and we and they. And she said, you know, I caught you. You're constantly referring to Germany as them. So I, I'm now, you know, first-generation immigrant, and the immigration process was a little odd, but <laughs> uh, American. And, uh, you know, I've long since stopped uh, thinking in German, but one thing is interesting. I read this in a book one day, and it's still true. I count in German. Hmm. This is a weird question. Do you ever dream in German? Not anymore. Okay. No, no. Actually, uh, after about a year in the U.S., I proudly reported back to the, to the center that I'm now dreaming in English, because I remember that very well. Let me ask you, who was Jack Barsky? Oh, Where does your name come from? It was stolen, and that was standard operating procedure. This is how the, the, the Soviets uh, manufactured uh, 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 false IDs. Uh, they would look for, in, uh, for records of uh, individuals who passed away <clears throat> at, at a young age. In my case, there's a, there's a, there's a cemetery not too far, it's someplace in Maryland, I forgot the, the town, where there's a gravestone that says Jack Barsky, uh, uh, born in 1944, passed away in 1954, I believe. Uh, he was 10 years old, and one of the resident agents, uh, who probably worked at the embassy here, found that and got the birth certificate uh, pretending to be the father of that young boy, and then it was sent to Moscow. And, I took that with me when I came to the United States and, and, and used this to build an ID and an identity with genuine American documents. But it wasn't just about building a name. There's a whole backstory there oh, sure. here, too. I mean, mm -hmm. cover an ID is just one mm -hmm. thing, but how, the KGB helped you to create an entire person behind Jack Barsky. Sure, yeah. Uh, you know, the, According to, to that birth certificate, that I was born in 44, so that made me already in my, mid, in my early 30s when I came here. It made me five years older than, than I really am. I was born in 49. Uh, so we constructed a cover story uh, that started out with that birth certificate, and then there was an agent in, in New York who went around the city and took pictures of places where I could have lived, where, and where I went to school, 
uh, you know, middle school, elementary school, high school, and even found information about a factory that I could have worked at. Uh, that was a factory that downtown Manhattan that uh, manufactured chemicals and that had burned down, so there was no more record of that factory. So we, uh, we, we covered the period of my, my life in the US uh, having worked in that factory, and then we came up with the idea that, uh, you know, that uh, I've dropped out of high school since I didn't have a high school diploma. And uh, my, my mother passed away during that time, and then I just moved up and went to work on a farm in upstate New York for several years to sort of, I dropped out of society and then I came back to New York to give it another try. And so that's when my real life started kicking in. I never really used any of that legend, it, but it was necessary to have just in case. It, it gave you the certainty that people ask you questions, that you have answers. It, it, the KGB gave you extensive training as we've already talked about, but there are only a certain amount of things that they can know, some nuances, some cultural yeah. differences that you kind of had to learn the hard way. Two stories I want you to kind of bring up. One is about a beer bottle in Canada, <laughs> and one is about a passport in Chicago. Can you give those stories very quickly so you can understand how the KGB couldn't possibly prepare you for every circumstance? No, that's, uh, and you know, if, 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 no, no matter how much you think about what could happen, uh, there's things that you're not prepared for. So here's some weird uh, uh, issues where I didn't have the cultural training to be an American right away. That took a while to assimilate. And uh, so my, I took a, a test trip to uh, Canada for three months to, to learn to live and you know speak the language and you know be as close to the United States as possible as you, as you can be without being in it. Uh, first night I went to dinner and, and a, at a restaurant and I got a bottle of beer and I'm looking around and there's no bottle opener. So I asked the, the waiter uh, and I was, uh, I was proud of the fact that I knew the English word for bottle opener. And I said, can, can I have a bottle opener? He looked at me like, hmm? I said, you know, I need to open this thing. And he, <laughs> with a smirk on his face, he took it and twisted the cap off. Well, we didn't have twist-off caps <laughs> in East Germany or uh, Russia, for that matter. So that was, that was just like weird, wasn't it? And, and, I, and, I, and I traveled with a West German passport, so they did have twist-off, so that's one. And the other one is that it's, it's only funny in hindsight. <laughs> You know, um, so when 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 I, I I entered the United States through O'Hare Airport in Chicago, I I was traveling. I was using a, a Canadian passport, and I had in, sewn into um, a uh, a piece of luggage. I had uh, I had this birth certificate of the Jack Barsky. So when I, I went to a hotel, and that's where I killed off the Canadian and brought to life, Jack, became Jack Barsky. Except that killing was much harder than expected. You know, how do you destroy a passport? Not that easy. They're flame retardant. So I tried to burn. You couldn't even burn the paper. And never mind, never mind the plastic outside, the picture. And you know, it started smelling. I said, I know, this doesn't work that way. And you, know, you start sweating. You know, you're, making a, you're making a stink in a hotel room. Hopefully nobody will, you know, stop by and ask what's going on. Yeah. Uh, fire alarm didn't go off, so eventually I took a pair of scissors and just cut it into small pieces and flushed it down the toilet. <laughs> <clears throat> so that that was not part of the curriculum: how to destroy a passport. <laughs> <clears throat> there are also uh, some. This mm. book is, by the way, there's hilarious moments where I tried to put the book down laughing. Another one was where I put myself in your shoes and I imagined I've I haven't been an undergrad in a long time. But you got the pleasure, for lack of a better word, you were going to be a chemistry professor yes. before you were brought into the KGB. Right. But because you didn't have a degree in the United States, even a high school degree, <clears throat> I had nothing. you had to go be a freshman at City College in New York and take freshman classes that you used to actually teach as a professor, like Chemistry 101 and Calculus 1. Yeah. I, obviously, you did pretty well, almost too well. 
<laughs> I, I taught at, actually at a much higher level than anything that I was exposed to at the undergraduate level. Like chemistry 101 was like Mickey Mouse stuff. You know. And you know, I, uh, calculus one, two, and three, uh, I taught at, at a more advanced level than that stuff. So it, it, these subjects were all a breeze. Now I got to tell you, I did not, I did not cut corners. I didn't for foreign language. I did not take German, <laughs> <laughs> and I did not take Spanish, which I had acquired on my own uh, during the first couple of years here. Uh, I took I took French, but anyway. Um, there was, a, uh, was an outcome that was unplanned and had something to do with still being ignorant about certain aspects of society. I aced the whole program, so now I'm a valedictorian. So they, 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 call, they called me into the office and said, so okay, we would like to, you know, you need to give a speech. I said, what? <laughs> no. Yes, yes, you have, to, you have the best GPA and that's it. I said, well, but I don't really deserve it. I'm, you know, let, let some younger kids uh, do this. No, 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 no. You, and oh, by the way, if, if you feel uncomfortable, you can write it and let somebody else read it. Well, that I couldn't accept. So <laughs> here is the undercover KGB agent who's giving a, a val, val, valedictory at a United States college. <laughs> and in New York City. In New York yeah. City. <laughs> And nobody ever noticed that this was a little bit odd. <laughs> you know, in terms of my age, in terms of the fact that I actually went through the program in three years. I mean, there was, nobody was alert to that. There's, there's something kind of unusual about this guy. Well, it shows how good you were. Another great story from this time that shows how good you were was you had, you befriended a young uh, man from <laughs> Hong Kong uh, <laughs> who you taught English to. Yeah. Which is fantastic. The fact that you, <laughs> you, he asked you, he's like, you're English, you know, you're a native speaker. Can you right. teach me how to be a native speaker? Well, uh, I noticed something when uh, he was in, in a political science class. So he was sitting next to me and he underlined a lot of his book. And I, and I told him, hey, listen, you got so much yellow here that it's useless. I mean, you're underlining almost the entire book. And then he said, well, these are all the words I don't understand. The kid had just come from, from China, and he was learning English uh, while he was in, in college. So I took him under my wings, and I said, you know, I applied what I learned in, in Moscow. I bought a book, a, a phonetics book, and we did phonetics exercises together. And I helped him, you know, learn English. And he actually wind up, he had to write an essay, uh, or a couple of essays, uh, for his application to uh, law school at Columbia, and one of them he wrote about me, how I, you know how <laughs> this nice American helped them learn English. Uh, yes, yeah. he he is now a very wealthy, very successful attorney in New York. <laughs> well, mm. now you have multiple degrees from different mm. continents, mm. Uh, and you go on to your career, which is working in information management right. for MetLife, the big bad nasty capitalist pig dog insurance company. Right. Not exactly what you expected when you got there. Right? Yeah, this is not an exaggeration. There were, uh, uh, the insurance companies for some reason were singled out as, as the epitome of evil in, in capitalism. So, and when I started working at MetLife, they were all still mutual and they were very paternalistic. In other words, you know, the. The compact, the unspoken, or the sometimes directly spoken compact was, if you start with us, you're going to retire with us. You're going to work here until retirement. You're going to get a gold watch, and, uh, and you're going to get a pension. Oh, wow, it felt like I'm back home. You know, <laughs> it was just, instead of, instead of the, uh, the insurance company back home, it was the state, it was the government that told you where to go, and then they would take care of you. And, you know, uh, same kind of feeling, and it felt really good, you know, because I was still, you know, I was so used to, you know, cradle to grave, and this was close enough, and, and there weren't any evil people, and the bosses were pretty nice, and they paid us well, and we got free lunch, pretty good. Uh, that started, uh, at that point, I started softening my attitude towards capitalism and towards the United States. Up until that point, I had no, I had no point of reference because as a bike messenger, 
you know, I, I wasn't really a, a member of a fully functioning member of society, and as a student, I wouldn't have known either. So after 10 years working in the United States for KGB, you actually got the emergency signal to leave. Right. Which is, people may have seen this in a TV show or movie, it sounds straight out of that, where you got the radio signal, but also a, a, a signal, on, a secret signal on the street saying, drop everything and go. Right. No, that's real. Uh, and, and that was one of, one of the more uh, poignant moments in, in my life. Uh, I had to tell the KGB in detail how I went from my apartment to work, or at least to the subway, and actually also what trains I took. But they knew the footpath that I used to get to the subway station. And there was a spot that I described to them where they could put signals. And the emergency signal was a red dot, and it was the size was about fist size. Uh, and one day, I walk to the subway, and I see that dot. And, and uh, now we're being filmed. I can't say the S word, but that's what came in, into my head. Because that, that meant it was, it was an order, get out of here. Uh, no questions asked. You know, I had some emergency documents that were hidden in a park in, uh, in Manhattan. Actually, it was in the Bronx. Uh, I was supposed to retrieve them and then make a beeline to Canada, uh, get in contact with the uh, Toronto would have been a trade, uh, a trade, uh, yeah, a trade delegation, or delegation or yeah. something like that, and which then would and they would then exfiltrate me to go back to Moscow. But I didn't do what that dot ordered me to do. Why not? Why did you stay? Well. Unbeknownst to the folks in Moscow, uh, I had a girl, a daughter here, she was 18 months old, and I had bonded with her like, you know, if you're fathers in this audience, you, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, you know, if you, this was the first child that I uh, was with uh, wa watching her grow up, and this was the first instance uh, that I, exper where I experienced unconditional love. That means you don't want anything in, you, you love him no matter what, and you don't want anything in return. And it broke my heart thinking that I might not be able to ever see her again if I go back. And even more so, um, I was afraid that she might not have a, a good life growing up without my support. It was a tough, decision to make, but I did make it eventually, and I stayed back. So this is in 1988, so you're about 40 years old, and you had talked about the fact that for those 40 years, you had never had that kind of an attachment that you couldn't just get up and walk away from. Yes, I, I, I was able to walk away from, from everybody, uh, and that includes, uh, rather shamefully, from my German spouse. So the KGB doesn't tend to just let people walk away especially in stay in the United States. How did you, and I love this story. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's somewhat disturbing at the same time, but it's fantastic. Mm. How did you convince the KGB to leave you alone? OK, so uh, <laughs> I had to figure out. I wanted to make sure that they, they wouldn't uh, come after me or possibly even do harm to my German family. So I was racking my brain. What do I do? What do I do? So eventually, I needed to tell him that I'm not following orders. So I wrote a Dear John letter, and uh, it went something like, Dear comrades, uh, I, have to re I have to tell you that I decided not to come back because I have contracted AIDS, and the only place where I could get treatment is this country. And then I s added some supporting information, and I, I actually traced it back to somebody I got the AIDS from. And that worked. I know that they believed it. Why, how do I know it? Because I also told them to uh, give uh, my German wife the money that was saved on my account. And they did. And they told your German wife that you had died of AIDS. Yes, they did. Yeah. That's when, and I know that because uh, my son, who is now 33 years old, uh, we, we have been in contact for the last five years. So he, he told me all the story that what it was like to be at the other end. Your story shifts pretty dramatically uh, when the FBI shows up at your door. 
let's take a little before that. Yeah. How did the FBI find out about you in the first place? Yeah, so there's another dramatic moment. I, I didn't think there would be another one because when, you know, what I, what my, you know, I, when I was in the clear and I pretty much thought uh, after about three months, uh, after I did that resignation thing, uh, I, th I thought uh, everything was okay. I would just like sort of blend in with American society and live out my life as a middle class individual with a family. Uh, my wife and I, we, we bought a house, we had another child, everything was just very normal. And I forgot all about my past. Uh, unbeknownst to me, there was a fellow uh, busy copying notes in the KGB archives and he smuggled them out in small pieces of paper in his socks and then transcribed them in his home and he buried the stuff in a milk can and eventually uh, at first, he, he approached the CIA. Uh, I believe the CIA or the, the, the American embassy, somebody in the American embassy, and they didn't believe him. So he went to the, to, the, to the British, and they got him out of there. That was just after the Soviet Union came down. But, uh, you know, certainly they wouldn't have let him out that easily. So he had a suitcase full of information and, and a one piece of that information was Jack Barsky and saying illegal. They didn't have much more. And that came to the FBI and they started looking for Jack Barsky. Now if this was Joe Smith, they wouldn't have found me, but there are not too many Jack Barskys. And pretty soon they, they zeroed in on the fellow who lived in, in a small t in a village in Pennsylvania and started investigating me. Now. Uh, they were very, very careful because there was at the time where there were uh, there were a couple of really bad cases of espionage, where, uh, moles in the CIA and the FBI, Robert Hansen, the FBI, and uh, Aldrich Ames in the CIA. So they were concerned that I might be running somebody in the government, and so it took them three full years to investigate me very, very carefully. And supposedly at that time, I was, I was the number one case on their list of, you know, of uh, counterintelligence cases. And then one day, eventually, they decided to, you know, to go for the kill, so to speak, and they said hello. That was a tense moment, trust me. <laughs> <laughs> well, the man who said hello is an FBI agent, or now retired FBI agent, right. named Joe Riley. Mm -hmm. You're really close friends with him now. Yes, I am. Actually, I, <laughs> I spent four days at his uh, house uh, while we, I'm on a, on a book tour, and we went uh, to the Lehigh Valley, and I spent some time, you know, he hosted me, and he's also the godfather to my last child, my daughter. Yeah, we were really close, and, you know, we, we were close in many respects. We, we like golf, uh, you, we are politically sort of uh, have the same ideas, and, uh, you know, obviously we also have a similar background, right. except at one point we were supposedly enemies, but it shows to tell you that not, you know, sometimes you associate yourself with a group and become an enemy of another group, when in fact the individuals in the other group could be just as good a friend as, as the folks in your group. It's really strange. Let me ask you a couple broader cultural mm -hmm. questions, because when we're trying to explain to lay people uh, what you were coming here today, we're like, oh, it's like, like Philip Jennings from the Americans, except he didn't kill a lot of people. <laughs> what do you think of that? What do you think of spy fiction, well, especially the Americans, right? This is a, a very popular TV show mm -hmm. based on the illegals program. Uh, do you just watch it and chuckle? Or do you go, okay, there's some truth to this? The Americans is the best show ever made because I'm going to be on <laughs> as an extra. We didn't plan this at all. <laughs> May 9th, episode 510. <laughs> I don't have a speaking part, but you know, I, I know the, uh, I have a relationship with the uh, creators and the two co producers, and they know what they're doing. They're doing entertainment. Uh, what they are doing really well, though, is, is, is uh, the, the psychology of undercover existence. Because anybody who's seen this, there's uh, Philip uh, con constantly is drawn to 
the American way of life, and he would tell his wife, why don't we just stay here? You know, it's, we've got a good life. And she is the one who's, who, who's bringing him back in, in line. Uh, that, that is quite realistic. And the other thing is, you know, it, it got really delicious when their daughter becomes a Christian. So. <laughs> uh, but other than that, I am not aware of a realistic depiction of uh, the kind of work that I did. You talked about Philip's drive to become more like an American. Let me ask you one final question about all of us who grew up in the United States have kind of memories or nostalgia about Americana. We grew up watching baseball, or we grew up watching American movies. I can think of the American movies I saw when I was seven years old that kind of, I still bring up today. I can still quote you scenes and lines from movies when I was a kid. How much or when, if you did, how much did you embrace American culture? And what, what do you say now is the thing that you embrace most? Is it, are you a, are you a Yankees fan? Are you, are you somebody, not that you should be, but are you a Yankees fan? Uh, or, or is there like, you know, you love John Hughes movies. You might not be the right generation for that. But is there, is there part of Americana I, that you really have embraced? I lack some of that background, yeah. but I, I became a Yankees fan when my son became a baseball fan. So um, every birthday from a certain age on, I would take him to a Yankees game and pay a lot of money for good <laughs> seats. Um, so I, know, I understand baseball better than football. Uh, I've always played basketball, that part I like, but it, let me tell you what, what I like the most about this country, and this will not be something you might expect. It's the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. If you go back and read, what, what the Founding Fathers meant to create, it is awesome. And unfortunately, we're, there's some forces at work to get away from that. Uh, that sort of makes me sad. Yeah. We're going to open it up for questions. I'm sure you guys have some. So if you wait, Amanda and Shauna both have microphones, so let them come to you. I saw a first hand coming up here. Amen has come at the mic. Uh, oh, so Peter is the executive director. He gets first question. Oh, he's and passing he it off. Handed it off. He's handing it off. Well, thank you very, th thank you very much for your presentation. You haven't talked about your collection effort. What kind of information did you collect and, and transmit back to the KGB? Well, I was in uh, political intelligence. Uh, quite honestly. I never personally handed any state secrets, handled any state secrets, or handed them over. I was not in a position to do so. Uh, one of my tasks was to identify individuals who might be candidates for recruitment. I never know, never knew what happened to those, whether people were being recruited, successfully recruited, no idea. Uh, I would occasionally, not, not periodically send uh, reports on, you know, the mood of the um, reaction of the American public to certain things and, you know, elections, you know, because I was in, in the, uh, I was living in society rather than looking at it from the outside. Um, so that, that's, per and then, and then I did a few like one off tasks and towards the end of my 10 years, uh, they asked me to also see if I can get my hands on some technology when I, I did send over a collection of computer programs. Uh, that's pretty much it. So, you know, if people ask me, were you successful? Probably not very much. You did set up a dead drop, you might want to mention. Yeah, um, so if you, as an illegal, I could do things that uh, others, the, the resident agents, you know, folks with diplomatic cover couldn't do. For instance, uh, there was, I don't know if there still is, but the, the Soviets were under restriction. They couldn't travel outside of you know, like 30 miles or whatever it was outside of DC or New York. If they did, they had to get permission. So, uh, and one time I was asked to, actually, first they asked me if I was going to do this, if I was ready to do this, and I had no idea why they asked me that question, but it must have been something extremely sensitive. Uh, go find a drop site someplace in New Hampshire, and when the time comes, uh, we may ask you to collect something of 
of a certain size. It was, they told me this wasn't just a little container, it would have been a suitcase or something. I'm thinking that was most likely uh, to be sort of a go between, uh, between a mole in the United States, it could have been Hansen or Ames and me, to avoid those molds to have direct contact with a resident agent. So, uh, you know, that was some of the value that they ascribed to an, an undercover person. I also was supposed to uh, observe a, the goings on at a military object. It's the, the Naval Weapons Station uh, in, uh, in um, Red Bank. I think it's still called Earl. And that, that was, that was, kind of odd because, you know, I was supposed to go there we'll occasionally see if there's any movement that could indicate preparation for war. This to me uh, was more, I believe, nostalgic thinking about how, how you know, they operated in, in World War II. And lastly, and again, this is to, in, in hindsight to me, this backward thinking, the, the value of an illegal that they, uh, that they, besides being able to move around in the country freely was, if, God forbid, relations were really bad and all diplomats got kicked out, they would still have somebody behind enemy Stay lines. Stay behind, yeah. Yep. Uh, you, can, you can debate whether that makes a whole lot of sense, particularly when missiles fly around. You know, right. Then there is no more front line anyway. Well, and New York would not be a particularly good place to be. You, you wouldn't be staying behind all that much. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Sean, do you have somebody? Yeah. Oh, now Peter. Okay, go ahead. Jack, first of all, thank you for sharing your fascinating story with us. I think it, it, it performs an incredible service. I also think that you, speaking as an intelligence officer, you may have been more successful than you realize. In other words, a number of people that you spotted for recruitment, yeah. you're not really sure what the follow-on was, and it's quite possible that they followed up on, your, on, your, on the people you uh, spotted. On your story about the KGB fellow burying the information, that was Victor Matrokin. Right. Yes. And the CIA did turn him away. He had a trunk full of secrets, which he'd buried in his dungeon. It was the CIA, dungeon. right. The reason I understood that they turned him away, uh, the officer at the time, and I know who it was, I won't name him, thought that this was just historical, you know, this was trash, this was oh, arthritis, boy, and probably boy. not of interest. He didn't have much of a career, did he? Well, it wasn't <laughs> that they disbelieved him. Oh. And, uh, and I think the now. fellow then about? took his story to the British, and I understand there was a woman who received him, and he told her his story, and she said, oh, sit down, wouldn't you like some tea? <laughs> they realized the importance of that, that trove of information. Let me ask you one question. I was struck by the fact that when you first came, I, I, I think it was when you first came to the West, you commented that you were struck by all the colors. Yeah. But what really was the impact of the Western way of life, the, the quality of life? It must have had an extraordinary impact. I, I always felt that people who came from the East to the West, it would just impact on them so strongly. Yeah, the material, material wealth was overwhelming, you know, when my, you know, the couple of trips to West Berlin, I didn't get to see much. Uh, but when I, when I spent time in, uh, in Canada, Montreal particularly, and there's a, uh, there's a, um, a big store, department store, that I spent hours in just like being totally blown away by the rich assortment of things you can buy. And I wanted some of that. And already this was the beginning of a dichotomy that we, all of us, lived through. Uh, we, we coveted the goods co that came from a society, society that we wanted to destroy. That's something that we all buried. We didn't want to think about it, right? Uh, so it didn't make a dent with regard to my uh, perception of uh, capitalism versus socialism because the rational Rationalization behind the thinking was that uh, uh, America and West Germany were rich because they exploited the third world. They got all the, their wealth out of you know, South America and Africa and so forth. That's what we were taught, taught anyway. Sean, <clears throat> right up here. Hi, 
I'm uh, Christopher from the German Spy Museum. I have two small little questions. Uh, the first one, why do you think uh, it is that, we, that you were picked by the KGB and not the firm? I mean, l l being born that, uh, that far east in Germany, you, uh, you would have struck me as a, as a candidate for the Stasi, not for yeah, the KGB no. at first. And the second one is, you mentioned that, uh, that incident with the beer in Canada, and you also mentioned that you, you saw some, some of these uh, caps that uh, turned open in West Germany. Yeah. Well, I've been living in Germany for 32 years and never saw one of them. Could you maybe pass that information on <laughs> well, which, which then, brand I, I should buy? Then, then I just uh, told you guys a lie, so I, I didn't know that. Uh, but uh, that, uh, interesting. So. Well, any, of, any, of, any of, I mean, at the time, so as a historian, in the 50s and early 60s, you would basically had a lot of influx, because of the Marshall Plan of American beer, but, but. into West Germany. So maybe there were Budweiser right. or another. I, 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 who knows? I, what? That's, that's my story, and I'm sticking to it. But that, that's an interesting question. Were you handed off to the KGB because you were potentially so good? Why, why didn't the Stasi keep you for themselves? Well, I'm, I'm not sure that even my first contact was a Stasi person. I thought so. But in hindsight, the Stasi and the KGB actually were pr pretty well walled off. They, uh, F, uh, their Spiegel, which is a German uh, news magazine, uh, did some research and they, they were looking for anything about me in the Stasi archives. There's no trace of it. And I'm one of the few Germans who doesn't have a record in there. Um, so I'm guessing somehow the, uh, the Russians got to me first and then told the Stasi, stay away from this guy. Uh, I don't know what the mechanics were, how they could pick some people, and the Stasi got most of them. Stasi got most of them. But you know, they had a couple of thousand agents in, in West Germany. Uh, and so you wonder why the, the Russians wanted to have somebody else in West Germany. But they, they had me to go, go there first before. Right up here, Alan. Not that I know who you are. No, here comes the mic. So my question has to do with actually the, the family dynamic of this thing. So Agent Riley shows up at your door, says, hey, we're the FBI. We've been looking at you. How does this reveal go to your American family, who I presume didn't know about your history? And what sort of, I guess, building back that trust, like, hey, my dad is someone I have, you know, didn't quite know or what their backstory was. Well, my wife actually knew, and this was a, a one thing that I told Vince that I don't remember at all. But I once told her we had a we had an argument, and I tried to make clear to her what I risked to stay back with her and and my our daughter Chelsea. And that was at a time when the FBI already had a bug in my kitchen. So they had my, uh, uh, my statement on tape. And that backfired, by the way, because her, respond, her reaction was, oh my god, then I'm not legal either. Oh, that's a, that's a little backstory behind that. She had married you yes. to stay in the country because you were a oh, US citizen. Thank you for, <laughs> yes, th thank you for pointing that out. Yeah. And so she I, was. Like a, the book, you have to put down the laugh. There's certain. It's so, and we so have surreal. to save time for signing. Oh, right. That's yeah. why I'm trying to catch your eye. Yeah. She, she, was, she was more legal at that point than I was. But, but anyway, um, <laughs> my, my kids were reacting very positively. I waited uh, with, for both of them until they were 18 years old. I, when I told my daughter, I mean, she cried because, you know, there's. Uh, how do you prove to a child how much you love them? And that was a big one, other than you know, maybe throwing yourself in front of a bus to save him. <laughs> and, and my son, when, when he heard the story, his eyes grew bigger and bigger because you know, he knew me as a really not working desk jockey in corporate America. He, I, I could never explain to him what I did because I was a manager at the time, and he once told his his friend and I overheard him, my dad doesn't do real work. He just sits in the office all day. <laughs> and all of a sudden, the, the faceless bureaucrat became an international spy. He said, oh, dad, you've got to write a book. <laughs>
Speaking of a book, uh, <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. please join me in thanking Jack Barsky for taking the time to talk to us here today. Thank you.